It's a pleasure to have with me this morning or afternoon English time, Simonetta Longhi, who is a senior lecturer, I believe, at the University of Reading in Reading, England, about an hour west of London, England. And she has written a lot on race and its economic effects. And today we're going to talk about racial wage differential. In other words, the difference in economic returns by race. Simonetta, good afternoon to you, English time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Let me ask you the first question. The question which economists don't ask often enough. Why? Why do racial differentials, or wage differentials arise? It's a very good question. And I think it's probably a good idea to start with a clarification. Because when we talk about racial wage differential, we're really talking about differences in wages between groups. So, for example, blacks and whites um, as a group, right? And this is sometimes, I would say, confused with um, discrimination and wage discrimination, um, which would actually mean that people are paid differently for doing the same job. While when we talk about racial wage differential, there is... A, the fact that uh, blacks and whites tend to do different type of jobs is part of the reason why we have the differences. So other reasons are characteristics, for example, um, different groups. Again, let's, let's keep the example of blacks and white might have different levels of education. So if a group have are, so people within a group are more likely to have a university degree compared to the other group then you would expect them to be channeled in different occupations that pay different kind of wages, and that's why the wage differential uh, arise. So there are very different reasons from the level of education. Occupational segregation is a very important reason because we see that um, minorities tend to be segregated in occupations that pay comparatively lower wages, even if sometimes they do have good qualifications. So this is... Uh, something that still needs to be explained. So it's a combination of both lack of skills, which might you say that itself indicates discrimination? Or do you, you want could. to separate things out? Okay. Yes, you could separate that too, because a lot of the discussion is about wage discrimination. So when we think about discrimination legislation, uh, we want people who do the same job to be paid the same, right? But there might be other type of discrimination, which ranges from example to uh, this, this, this type of discrimination that imposes to some extent um, um, residential segregation. So some group are in areas where schools are of lower quality, then therefore the type of education that they get is not as good, they have less probability to go to a good university and all this accumulates over time. So there is still discrimination. It is not all and only in the labor market. A lot of it actually comes before that. Let me ask you a hard question. So far, this was an easy question, maybe. A hard question is, clearly there are differences arising at the entire stage of the life, even before people get into the labor market. Any feel about what point it's most efficient for government to attack those differences in order to result in better outcomes in the long run in labor markets? Well, you could argue it's important to tackle differences as soon as possible. For example, it's kind of a circle, right? So you have uh, um, someone from a minority who doesn't have a good job. They're more likely to be in poverty. Their children will grow up in poverty. They will have less life chances and then residential segregation, all this kind of stuff. So if you want, you know, kind of reducing child poverty, you could argue is the first thing that one could do. And then in the long run, it might actually mean a decrease in wage differentials across groups. But from a point of view of a government, this is kind of a nice policies which will have benefits so much far in the future that, you know, um, but, you know, eradicating child poverty is something that, you know, it should be important in itself, but it might have kind of positive spillovers if you want to. Let me make an interesting, I think it's an interesting international comparison. I mean, the U.S. has had race problems since its inception. 1600s. 
and these are very long standing. Now, I know when I spent a year in England in 1971, my first sabbatical, I think 2% of the English population was not English native. Okay? And so if there are racial wage differentials in the UK, which there are, they're clearly of much newer origin than those in the US. And yet, am I right to say that wage differentials by race are pretty large in England too, just as they are here? They are. And uh, the comparison between the US and the UK is particularly interesting because what, as you said, um, race and the discussion about race is relatively new. Uh, and it, it, information about race was not asked until relatively recently. So it, it is an important point. And a lot of racial minorities in the UK have a large proportion of people who are still immigrants. So if you look at wage gaps of these groups, you will have conflated part of the immigration story, the fact that they might have uh, received their level of their, their education somewhere else and not in the UK, and the racial skin color uh, idea. But also when you look at people who are second generation, so they have um, a minority background, we call it minority here, and <laughs> <laughs> we distinguish between groups based on really the, the area where they come from. Also those who are from second generation, they do uh, suffer wage uh, gaps. And I think the, the important thing that often we don't discuss is that the experience of the different minorities is very different. So actually some of them, typically the Indian and the Chinese, on average as a group, they're paid quite well, uh, more or less similarly to white British in the UK, while other groups such as Pakistani and Bangladeshi, they do have large wage gaps that uh, may reach about 20, 30 percent when you don't take into account, you know, education and all these kind of things. So it is a problem also here. And the fact that it affects, sorry. That's actually very disturbing because, I mean, in the U.S., this is ingrained. Essential. To me, race is the essential issue in American history. It has been since the inception. And yet to hear that in the U.K., a similar problem arises basically in just two generations, which to me is nothing, uh, is very disturbing. I mean, this is something ingrained in human nature. What's going on? <laughs> Our it's difficult to say it, 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 it is difficult to say it is ingrained in human nature, nature because what I, from what my understanding, the concept itself of race is relatively new. Again, it, you know, it's kind of, it was more or less if you wanted to justify slavery, right? So, and when we think biologically, there are no, really no races. But people do see the different skin colors. And when you talk to people who have a different skin colors, they do see, they do tell you that, you know, there is still a problem. And even if we want to agree that, you know, we, we're color, color blind and these things don't exist, I think they, they do. So there is some kind of implicit bias in all of us, and it has been shown in various, various type of research psychologically also. What are we going to do about it? I mean, if you were running the United Kingdom, you become prime minister, which is not probably going to happen anytime soon, and your government controls the House of Commons. What would the, if you, what, what are the two things you would recommend doing that would be most effective in at least minimizing or reducing the incidence of the problem? Well, ideally, you would want to change people's mind. I think we are getting there, but it's going to be slow, right? So to kind of really reduce this implicit bias that we are kind of all, that we all have. Um, I don't think there's any kind of policy I could think of in that sense. But uh, um, clearly anti-discrimination laws, it's, it's always good. Um, affirmative actions, I'm, I'm all for these kind of things. And especially if they are well targeted to those groups who are really lagging behind. Because as I mentioned, some, min some minority might not necessarily, you know, need additional help, but some others would. And I think we're also seeing, can I continue? Go ahead. All right, thank you. 
So we've also seen that employers are also starting to realize that it's important to have a diverse workforce. So there are some studies that suggest that um, those employers who have a more diverse workforce also are more um, productive, they do their business better. And uh, so there is some realization that this is important. And also when you see within um, organization, you do see that there is kind of some kind of problems within organizations, not only in terms of hiring minorities, but especially um, uh, for their progressions in higher paying jobs. Um, there seem to be, this is anecdotal evidence and qualitative evidence, but there is some, some indication, you know, that, that the minorities are more likely to, to leave their employer because of lack of career progression and that kind of things. I think, you know, before really thinking of policy, one would want to see that this is actually something which, which is true across the board with some more, you know, in-depth analysis. But uh, um, there would be two, I think, pushing employers to kind of improve their pipeline and the diversity in their pipeline would be something good. Interesting. What you're saying now is starting way down the road among people who are already employed, the exact opposite of what we're talking about helping early on. Is it fair to say we really don't know what the best point to intervene is? I agree, yes. Uh, ideally, we would want to, to, in, to intervene at different points, uh, because if you think about our society, we have young people, we have people who are entering the labor market, who we have some who are re already there. So, you know, I think it, it's a good idea to kind of tra target these different types of population at the same time, even if some, you know, perhaps you could argue that targeting when they are young, it's, it's, it's more efficient. But, you know, um, let me give you one final question, OK, and see if this. Not really a policy intervention, but something we're doing. I turn on the news in the evening to watch the evening news most nights. And the main station we watch, which is NBC News, the presenter is African-American, although quite light-skinned. On the weekend, his substitute is a Cuban-American. In other words, a remarkable number of these presenters are minorities. Are these role models that will make a difference, do you think? Do we know anything about the role of role models, or is this just window dressing? Again, it's not, it's more like qualitative evidence and <laughs> talking to people. And it, it, it does seem that role models are important because when someone is hired in a job, they do look around and ask themselves, you know, am I the only one? Is there anybody that looks like me here? Do I feel comfortable? Do, do I feel that I belong or not? So I think these are important. And also because in terms of career progression, it's more likely that if you have a mentor and a sponsors, they will understand you better if they look like you and if they had sim similar experiences than you. So I think that would be important in, in general, yeah. That's a nice way of phrasing it. Depends not only on what you see, but whom you're with. And if what you see is similar to you, it's encouraging. If whom you're with is similar to you, you might be more willing to accept their mentoring, their help, et cetera. Fascinating. Timonetta Longhi, thank you very much for being with me this afternoon or morning on where we are. And uh, it's a fascinating topic. Thanks a lot. Thanks to you.